Wagwan, everybody. Welcome to the This Afemi History Podcast, where we'll be speaking about history and as well family history and how history relates in terms of Caribbean people um, for the present as well as in the past and how in the past, what that does and brings forth for what we are going through at present and what we can learn from our history, from our family, and take that moving forward. So I do hope you enjoy the podcast. And if you like it, please ensure to subscribe, like, and review. Thank you. In this episode, I will be speaking with Justine K. Collins, who is a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at SOAS University of London Faculty of Law. And we'll be discussing her paper on the Barbados Slave Codes of 1660s. So let's have a listen. So, um... Again, Justine, I just want to thank you so much for coming on to the podcast to speak about the slave codes, in particular the Barbados slave code of the 1660s. And the first question will be, with the slave codes of of Barbados, there was important slave codes of 1660s was an important piece of legislation in the British Caribbean. And there was, you know, three very important uh, points within this act. And can you just be able to speak to some of the uh, these particular points? First one being defining people as property. Sure. So if we start with the preamble of the 1661 Act, um, which is the, its introduction before the legal provisions, mm-hmm. um, it stated that um they, meaning the assembly and the settlers, were to protect the enslaved as they do other goods and chattels. And chattels under English property law was a movable item of personal property, which can be animate or inanimate and can can be perishable. And using chattels to define or describe enslaved persons gave them a wide um, ambit on how they can control them because mm-hmm. as chattels and slave persons could be used as mortgage, they can be hired, they can be sold up for debts, they could be be pleated to heirs, um, distributed in estate settlements, um, they could be disposed of in accordance with inheritance laws of real estate, and they be could be entailed and subject to a widow's right of dawa. And they could be also co- um, valued in currency or in sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, but Eventually, by um, one of the acts, um, amendments in 1668, the Barbadian Assembly then referred to enslaved persons as estate real, um, real estate, which likened an enslaved person to a uh, more permanent structure like land or yeah. building or a home. And I believe in doing that, they wanted to give enslaved um, owners the ability to um, put their enslaving wills um, or, or um, have them permanently pass down within their line, you know? Yes. But I, I, I believe like in looking throughout the, um, the different codes in the English speaking colonies, most of them eventually defined enslave as real estate. But I believe in practice, it was a hybrid between the two. Mm-hmm. because they were definitely treated as chattels you know yeah. they were I- items of like they were treated as goods and movable mm-hmm. but also they, they there were a lot of them that were bequeathed in wills and and, and trust and left in estates and so forth um so i think defining someone as a person in in property especially as a movable or a permanent structure yeah. is as as, as basic <laughs> mm-hmm. as you can be you know to hold a person you know yeah in and, and to control them in any way shape or form you know this gave them quite an, an ambit as to as to what they can do with enslaved persons to the point of you know a chattel could be destroyed yeah. and enslaved persons as you saw were dismembered and were killed Mm-hmm. For whatever okay. reason, and and there were no there were no um consequences of this. You had a right to destroy a property. No one can take you to task for this. Yeah, 
which is, yeah, uh, yeah it, it, just the thought of that is just, uh, you know, just absolutely yeah. unreal. But unfortunately, that did happen. And, yeah. and the fact that you mentioned that, you know, they are, they were considered to be movable property, meaning yeah. that, you know, yes, they were bequeathed, and then whoever they happened to bequeath them to could be able to lease them out, right? Yeah, you can hire them out. They yeah. were actually, there were actually a lot of laws, um, posts that, um, plantation boom within the the slavery codes that that then prohibited them from being hired out wow. because what happened is when they started hiring them out and they went to more urban urban plantations they could earn money yeah and then they could afford their manumission mm -hmm. they did not want that they did yeah. not want them to manumit themselves so there are actual laws especially in the latter so like in the 1668 um code in um barbados and in this 1696 code i believe of jamaica there were prohibitions against hiring them out for that mm -hmm. particular um wow. purpose they did not want them to do that but you see um property was a, a sanctity in english law for the english mm -hmm. there was a lot of pride in property and as such, you know, they had to preserve whatever property rights they have, even yeah. if it was in persons, you know, and this preservation you can see in compensation for loss. So yeah. if, for instance, um, an enslaved person was, was found on another person's um, estate and they claim the person tried to attack them and they killed them, the treasury will compensate the person who lost the, the enslaved person oh. because they lost property. Mm -hmm. So whatever that person was valued in, in sugar, in Muscovado sugar, they would, the treasury would pay it wow. because slavery benefited the entire empire. Mm -hmm. So they did not mind doing that. You know, the fact that um, up to 2015, the British public were paying <laughs> taxes to pay back um yeah. the loan taken by the British government to compensate slave owners after emancipation is enough said that yes. that was their personal property and they they meant that they deserve compensation for it and the British government gave them that compensation. Exactly. So, yeah. And then the second point of the establishment of con control of power pretty yes. much. Yes. So the control of power um again is to do with uh what they call is the policing laws of slavery so the slave codes were essentially the policing laws of slavery because they had everything to do with the control and management of of the enslaved persons um if you look at the particular provisions of the code it, they went from either having to search um the premises twice per week to ensure that they didn't hide any items that were prohibited so they weren't allowed drums they weren't allowed items of their own personal property you know they just had to have a bed or yeah. sleep on the ground whichever whichever way it was they, they nothing else was supposed to be inside there because everything else they gave to them um mm -hmm. they had to have a ticketing system so they had a ticket if they had to leave the plantation the ticket would be issued. They had the ticket would say the time they had to leave, the time they had to return, mm -hmm. and the purpose for with, for why they were leaving. And in addition to that, they had a white um overseer had to leave with them. Yeah. So they must be accompanied by a white person if they were to leave the plantation. Mm -hmm. So it it was all manner of control. Yeah. And then also the other laws had to do with them running away so abscondment yeah. so there were huge fines for running away um both on their their owners mm -hmm. <laughs> and on persons they felt saw them or, or helped them yeah or hid them um if they if they retrieved them apprehended them they were owners on them to return them and they would get you know huge rewards from the treasury yeah. if they didn't uh, they would they would be huge fines yeah um so there were a lot of these sort of is either trying to prevent their running away or restrict their movement. And then there was also restrictions in their gathering. Yeah. Um, they couldn't be gathered um in large numbers. I believe if, if for every one to three or one to five persons, they had to be a white person present, yeah. even if this was within um a meeting for her instructions on the plantation as to what they had to do. Um, white persons must be prevalent within any form of association because they they were afraid of any clandestine meetings and rituals because yeah. they 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 said that in time they met was to do you know satanic rituals and obia and they did not trust what this meant so again all these sorts of things were restricting they they restricted 
any form of musical enjoyment, you know. Um, I often wonder when I see when I see movies that have the slaves beating the drums, and I think, where are yeah. they doing this? Because <laughs> there were there were really um, stringent laws against this. Maybe yeah. they ran away to do it. I don't know, but um, yeah, they they were very much against this this sort of any any form of of gathering or togetherness. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this basically, this basically, this power, this control power, was basically yeah. just to break them, break yes, them down, yes. so they didn't have any any cause for them to kind of, you know, rebel against exactly. what was the what was this massive oppression that was on exactly. Them. And we haven't even touched on the punishments for yeah. <laughs> if if they did run away yeah. or you know have an offense. I mean, the first offense was severe whipping. Yeah. Um, which was ordered by the justice of the peace. Mm -hmm. The second offense, they would be whipped and they'll have their nose slit and their face burnt. And the third offense um, was to be handed down by the the governor of the council. Um, And in that regard, it was to his discretion. So that meant it could be dismemberment or death. It depended on on how serious the offense was. Mm -hmm. So it was quite bad. I I actually wrote of one... um, there was one source I saw where to combat running away, they had they they removed the air of a man, had him cook it and eat it. You oh. know? Yeah. And <laughs> again, all, all of this is, is forms of control, mental, yeah. physical, yeah. you know, it's it it was pretty gruesome. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Gruesome. Yeah. Definitely. And then thirdly, just the establishment, they defined race which yes. is, you know, up until today is very impactful. But can you just go through on this particular, on the slave code? Sure. So um, then slave Africans within the preamble, again, so that's the introduction to mm-hmm. the slave codes were referred to as heathenish, brutish, and an uncertain dangerous pride of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but before we delve into the implications about what the wording of the preamble meant, um, we need to first, look at the fact that the Barbadian Assembly made two sets of codes within that epoch, which was um, when they made them concurrently, which was the slave code and the concurrent um, Barbadian servant code. And they did this purposely because prior to the slave codes, I believe in the 1650s, um, there were reports from visitors and adventurers that they couldn't tell the difference in treatment between indentured white servants and enslaved yeah. persons. They felt they were similar. And so um, Governor Waldron at the time, um, in, in creating a slave code, said, no, this has to be, <laughs> there, there, there's quite a difference between yeah. a white person and, and enslaved Africans. And so you can see throughout the wording of the indentured um, workers code, that there was the use of Christian mm. um, denoting to white, yes. but in the slave code, Negro denoting to black or enslaved African. Yeah. Um, and Negro was taken from the word black from the Spanish or the Portuguese who um, history tells us started the whole colonial slavery movement. Yeah. You know, but if we look at the meaning of like behind using words such as brutish and volatile and yep. so forth, you know, these all have negative connotations of, you know, being wild and violent and wayward and even use it on certain pride of people um, gives connotations of, of something animalistic. Yeah. So it all was to do with with real debasement and and um you know oppression <laughs> um yeah very oppressive language you know yeah yes. yeah yes. very harsh very harsh for sure and yes. definitely again part of that whole um demoralizing aspect exactly of a group of people and you know as i said before it just it seems to be that we're still kind of fighting those still same connotations that were yes. defined right yes exactly yeah. And so with this law, it, you know, it defined major concerns that the planters faced with the enslaved Africans. And yes. you, you mentioned four points in your article. So again, dealing with the growing numbers, we'll start there first. Yeah, sure. So with the, with the, um, the introduction of sugar cane as a cash crop, um, then this necessi- necessitated more workers. 
And within um, the 1600s the, uh, to the 1700s, there was a vast growth of enslaved Africans. Yeah. This jumped from, in the, in the 1600s, enslaved Africans were probably in excess of 6,000, mm-hmm. whereas um, white colonials were over 18,000. By the 1700s, the white colonials remained within the 18,000 range, whereas the enslaved Africans jumped to 55,000 yeah. plus. And so the white settlers were very cognizant that in, in numbers, their strength, their strength yeah. in numbers. And so we have to constantly find ways to curb any sense of entitlement to rebel yeah. or to run away or to assert rights. And this is why the slavery codes constantly had amendments because mm-hmm they had to adapt to every new population that came in and we had to have more stringent rules, rules, sorry, for um, running away or or any form of gathering that would trigger um, an uprising. Yeah. You know, so this, this um, growth in numbers was very much um, a response of of fear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, they instigated it for their own gain, but at the same time, they had to to try and control it in order to 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 stay ahead basically exactly yeah exactly and then of course yeah. the second point is the the status as property well as property again this this ties into the other two points which yeah. was you know the differences in culture and the innate re, um, rebellious nature mm-hmm. um the as property <laughs> um again this is a de- debasement you know yeah and the fact that they were culturally different, um, which was essentially, um, they tied this into not only their physicality and their, co- and their color, yeah. but also the fact that they, they saw them as heathens and, and naturally belligerent and volatile. And so they needed civilization. They needed civilizing. Yeah. Um, but even when they received baptismal, bat- baptism, sorry, which was not huge in the British islands anyway, um, this did not add to them being free you know even if they did get permission to marry this again did not gain them any sort of um points on being closer to manumission yeah so again the the basis of all these things were fair you know Mm -hmm. we don't know (laughs) these people we just know they're different we were gaining from them. So we either we're controlling them now and where we cannot control them, we would destroy them. Yeah. And this is why, you know, when the offenses were so great yeah. in their estimation, they killed them. Mm-hmm. And in killing them, it was nothing to them because they would be compensated. They received compensation exactly. from the treasury for killing them because they it was their own personal property. But because it benefited the entire um, empire they were allowed to do this you know it was not a problem yeah yeah definitely to see them just as uh as you said an innate object they were just yes. their property they could do anything that they wanted to exactly. and if they showed some sort of disagreement yes they could be done away with so they don't exactly. have to deal with it which is exactly you know uh, when you look back on it just very it is harsh, but it's just unbelievable at the same time. Yes. This is what humans, uh, unfortunately, did at that time um, to others. And then, of course, yes. I know that you talked about the difference in culture, because this is huge. Because, again, if people without a culture, without knowing their past, you just beat it out of them or they don't remember. So, again, can you speak a little bit more about uh, the difference in culture? Well, yes. Um. Well, from... The moment they put them on the, the slave ships, you know, they separated them yeah. um, from their tribes because, again, you know, they did not want them to have any form of familiarity, sense of identity, sense of kinship. Because remember, Africa is a continent of vast yeah. place with so much different language and the areas they took the enslaved persons from ranged from, you know, the gold and ivory coast yeah all over to like within the the neck and the thickness of 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 west africa towards central africa even yes and you have so much differences in in language that it would be very difficult for them to to form any sense of identity so you started from then and then you bring them onto an island to work together and on the you know immense subjugation yeah immense debasement 
in terms of treatment, um, not only from the beatings, but the way they were spoken to, the yeah. way they were moved about, the way they were policed, you know, um, and this all because they were other, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when I was looking at um, the wording of how they used, um, you know, the volatile in nature and pride and, you know, a certain pride of people, it brought me back to um, Hobbes' theory on nature and how he sees anything outside of what is, you know, the dominant European culture as chaotic. And they would believe that differences in culture was chaotic, you yeah. know, that needed civilization that justified their civilizing them. So they believed they were doing them a good. This was good for them to be subjugated because left on their own, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's, again, it's a whole part of the whole, um, you know, taking the human out of the human so to speak exactly because you're just basically you're taking them away from there from what they know is familiar exactly. and then you're defining them as property and of course you're speaking a language that they may not speak yeah. and again you're putting this massive amounts of pressure on their movements on everything that they do mm -hmm. again further instilling that fear within them yes yes right? exactly you know, and that yeah. kind of brings us to this last point of the innate rebellious nature. I mean, who wouldn't, re you know, exactly. rebel being exactly. under that type of pressure? Yes. I mean, um, it's easy to say <laughs> because, yes. of course, they wanted justification for having right. rules. And also when a rebellion, which was inevitable to happen, I mean, mm -hmm. human beings are made to to survive like yeah. this, this is something that kicks in naturally exactly. if you put anyone under pressure if you put anyone under threat mm -hmm. the innate nature would be to rebel against being you know tortured and controlled that's right so saying it's innate to just african people and it's, it's it was in itself problematic but again this was how um it was at that time that's how they saw because this, these were a set of people they claim to not know you know yeah. No, um, definitely. So, this was, so this was easy to say but of course there were lots of rebellions and and again this is a, a this was one of the their biggest fear because they were outnumbered um even when there were rumors of rebellions um because of course people who were um scared would speak out in advance mm -hmm. you know um and uh, there was one example in Barbados where they they captured 18 men that were um yeah rumored to have to want to start a rebellion or incite an uprising and they killed all 18 of them from hanging to drawn and quartered and the, the, those that were drawn drawn and quartered by a hostess were were you know paraded through the streets headless and and, and cut in half and this was a deterrent yeah. to the other enslaved persons from even trying or trying to conceive such ideas so um <laughs> they say innate rebellious nature um and then they they put in laws which they tried to curb this yeah. didn't but then even when it did, did occur you know they had these punishments as um justifications for why they why they had to act the way they acted yeah yeah well, and, and using all these words and defining it um you know and then of course making this as a law yeah. further adds to that another uh, you know another layer of all of this oppression onto a exactly. people for them to benefit because they didn't they figured they didn't see them as value right yes, exactly. so then going into what you know the the Barbados slave code you know provided the template to other slave codes within the colonies of the British yes. as well as yes. in the Americas can you just speak to this a little bit sure so I believe the first country after Barbados that um, instituted a similar code mm -hmm. was Jamaica. So Barbados started in 1661 yeah. and then Barbados followed in 1664. And that was because um, one of the uh, the temporary governors of Barbados at the time, Thomas Modiford, he was a landowner there. He became a governor in Barbados then and he moved in slave persons with him along with the slave code. Wow. So the 1664 Jamaican slave code was a verbatim um, copy of the Barbadian one. Um, what it did not plan for was the fact that 
Barbados differ, not Barbados, sorry. Yes, Barbados differed completely from Jamaica. Yeah. In terrain. And also um, there were um, extant persons on Jamaica, which were the formerly enslaved of the Spanish colon of the of when the Spanish when the Spanish colonized Jamaica, yeah. um, which were some of the persons that started marinage. So you had these persons who um would be inspiration for yes. the existing enslaved persons under the British to run away and 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 meet them in those in 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 those mountains where where they resided, and then also the terrain of of Jamaica and itself was completely different, vastly different. Yeah. There were so much places that they can hide and form entire communities and mask it, and they would not know. And then yeah. you have, because you had those enslaved persons that were there before, they knew the land at the back of their hands much more than the English people do. Yeah. So they knew where to hide them. So they had, you know, they had a hard time initially yeah. with this code and they eventually had to had to make changes to suit Jamaica. So then yeah. they had one of the harshest, one of the harshest slave codes in, in, in the colonies because they had to institute, they believed they had to institute really harsh mm -hmm. um, punishments to combat running away, to combat rebellion. And it was so bad that even some of the um, the visitors spoke of it. Mm -hmm. They spoke of, you know, I remember one of, it was a captain. Um, he spoke of the amount of children that um, enslaved persons would have, and they would still have to do the same workload after having eight enslaved children. Yeah. You know, they would still have to do the same workload. And he said, "This is why they'll." He said, "This is why they'll continue to run away because the thing is with Jamaica, they never stopped. Yeah, they never stopped running away. So the act was not as successful there as it was in Barbados. You know, mm -hmm. um, so much so that Barbados had to, um, Jamaica had to have a sort of militarized um colony." Mm -hmm. And it was like that for quite a while after the the English colonized there because they were constant uprising and yeah. also the threat from the Spanish wanting to <laughs> reconquer of course, of um, course. the colony. So they were they had martial law existing all the time. Yeah. And if you look at um, Jamaica currently, martial law is, all, is still it's still a thing that that happens quite often. Yeah. Um, so I always I always found that interesting. Like from the time of colonization to modern day, That's they right. use they use um martial law to curb um unrest, civil unrest. Yeah. Um. So after Jamaica, um, I believe there was the um South Carolina, yeah. which was a direct movement of enslaved persons, planters and the law <laughs> to the S South Carolina to form that slave colony there. Yeah. And again, they had to adjust and adapt the law to meet, to suit their terrain, because again, America, North America is a vast, yes. much vaster land than Barbados and the, and the colonies in the Caribbean. So they had to put very stringent laws to combat running away and uprisings. And then they also targeted not just um, African enslaved, but he targeted mestizos and also um, indigenous persons. Yes. They had those two named um, within the law. And then the Leeward Islands um, came after this. So this was Antigua, um, St. Kitts and Nevis, so St. Kitts and Christopher, Nevis, um, what is now the, um, the Virgin Islands, Montserrat, they had all these islands institute their own version of the slave code. It came a little bit later than the other islands. And that was because um, with the exception of Antigua, the others were not as big cultivation yeah. societies as Barbados were. But um, they necess necessitated this again when all the, the crop cultivation started rising. And so they had to institute that. And one of the biggest things they tried to combat was interracial um mixing because this was something that was very rampant in those in those um colonies yeah yeah and then um from carolina um, south carolina greatly influenced georgia georgia had a verbatim um slave code as well similar to south carolina and then we have the colonies such as bermuda and virginia and massachusetts which, although they did not verbatim copy the slave code, mm -hmm. they influenced it in some way, shape, or form. And um, 
you can see from like historical documents that there've always been a constant movement of persons, yep. um, whether free or non-free, from Barbados to Virginia, mm-hmm. from Bermuda to Virginia, from Barbados to Massachusetts, yep. <laughs> from Bermuda yep. to, to Massachusetts, and, and also uh, a pull from those places also. So like, if, for instance, in Massachusetts, there were the Pequa Wars in the early 1600s where the English won against the Pequa Indians. Mm -hmm. Um, but they couldn't control them. So they put a whole set of them on a boat and shipped them to the Caribbean, you know? And in in turn, they asked for enslaved persons to be shipped to them. So there was this also, this constant movement of of indentured persons who they they found to be ultra rebellious or uber rebellious to, you know, Bermuda, to Jamaica, to Barbados, and to all the other little islands. Um, The sources are very um, scant, yeah. with that but they're there because mm-hmm. I came across them and it's really interesting and if you look as far as and even like New Jersey and New York and Rhode Island the code might not have moved but the slave courts moved yes in terms of how they operated which was summary judgments in terms of an enslaved person could not give evidence yeah <laughs> Um, to help out another enslaved person. They couldn't get give evidence. They couldn't even give evidence to, you know, to excuse themselves. But enslaved persons could give it against yes. each other, yeah. you know. So once an offense was brought, it was, okay, you heard by the justice of the peace and these other discreet persons of the town mm-hmm. and judgment was passed down against you. So this form of slave, slave court was passed from uh, colony to colony in English-speaking um Americas from the Caribbean, um, which again speaks to this whole exchange and movement of persons, you know. Yes. Um yes. free and non-free. Mm-hmm. Um whether whether enslaved person, whether the um the enslaved owners, planters, sailors, um this really resonated um in terms of practices because yeah. um a lot of slave law came from from practice as well. Yes, you know, of course. Came yeah. from how, how they were treated, you know, um, because before the slave code was enacted in Barbados, they had a certain way of treating them. They always treated them as chattel. Yeah. So this was something that became the norm. Because if you look at how, um, for instance, uh, slave status is passed um, in Virginia, it's also similar to Barbados. Yeah. And, and this is from the matrilineal line from mother to child. Mm-hmm. you know, which differs from how it usually passes in English law, which is from, it passes through the father. Yeah. A child inherits the, you know, <laughs> the status of the father. But because they knew in colonial slavery, a lot of the fathers of enslaved children tended to be white. Yes. And they wanted to combat this. This what this became a practice. This became a practice before it became a law. So this was something that was passed in practice before Virginia then put it in law later on in the 1700s. But for from 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 the beginning of you know colonial plantation slavery, you know this was instituted. Like we we have to do this on the on the on the female line in order to keep um, perpetuity in yep. enslaved um, offspring. Yeah. No, no, definitely. I've definitely seen the records of, you know, a father selling his children, um, yes. you know, that are his children, but yes. because of he didn't manumit the the mother, they yes. were still considered to be his slaves, even though they were his children. Exactly. Yeah. I even saw, I even, there was even a, a case done by, I think, Jennifer Morgan. Mm-hmm. She does a lot of work on, on, on um, enslaved women. Okay. And there was a particular case she did where um the enslaved owner manumitted the mother mm-hmm. and the mother thought like you know it, like her children were automatically manumitted and he said no. No. No, you alone are manumitted and 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 this was a huge thing and he, he thought she should be grateful to be manumitted. <laughs> but she, she didn't want to be manumitted if her children were not of course. Exactly. But exactly. Yeah, that, that, that was the Muda and Bahamas were much more marine societies. So they had to um most of the enslaved persons were divers. So they do for pearls and other treasures they can find and they were fishermen. 
So they had a big fishing industry, salted fish and corn fish and that sort of thing. And they were also sailors. So they would help um the 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 ship owners sail from islands to the other with imports and exports and so forth. Um, but even then they found that the even the smaller growth in their islands necessitated a slave code. Okay. And they had to bring it in to stop the intermixing. Particularly, they had a huge problem with that in, in Bermuda. And they thought they had to bring this in to, to stop the intermixing and also to stop any any form of cultural bonding because they started having little drum sessions and meetings mm-hmm. because again, the society was smaller. So people tended to be more huddled together and they did not want that because they thought anytime this is happening, there'll be cause for rebellion. So then they prohibited carrying of drums and carrying of any form of, you know, instruments to be the drums or or any form of fiddles and so yeah. forth were strictly banned and they had really huge um stringent um punishments if they did not um adhere to this. Um and then we have colonies such as Virginia and the Chesapeake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also as far as um you know Massachusetts and New Jersey and New York Rhode Island, who did not necessarily copy the slave codes, but they had slave courts, which okay. were very um, reminiscent of the the summary judgment slave courts, slave courts in the in in Barbados. You know okay. where mm-hmm. an enslaved person was not allowed um, uh, to give evidence. <laughs> evidence mm-hmm. was only allowed to be given against them. So yes. It was very much a summary trial. You had the justice of the peace come in, listen to whatever evidence was against them, and just made a ruling, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just that's just how it was throughout the colonies. And but what was very interesting with Massachusetts, Virginia, um, Bermuda, and Barbados is that there were constant movement of persons throughout there. You know, um, for instance, um, Boston. Um, had you know the Pequa Wars in yep. the early you know 1600s, and the British uh won, uh, but they couldn't control them, so they decided we're going to send them <laughs> down to the islands in exchange for enslaved persons. Wow! So they had a constant movement of of enslaved persons directly from Barbados, Jamaica to um to Virginia and mm-hmm. to. Uh, Massachusetts and and then the movement of indigenous persons there yeah um so that and with movement of persons would be the movement of the the enslaved owners mm-hmm. and also the laws and the practices they 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 they've already had in those colonies so this is why even though it it probably was not a verbatim movement of the code in those colonies it yeah. was at least the same movement of the practices because they yes. did have they did have similar laws in terms of seeing enslaved persons as real estate also mm-hmm. referring to them as chattel yeah. um the status of enslaved children passed matrilineally meaning passing from the mother mm-hmm. instead of from the father and this was because uh, they did not want <laughs> they did not want um enslaved children to be automatically free because many yeah. times the fathers were white men mm-hmm. um and this is why it changed because if you look at the laws, how they usually are, a child gained the status of their father. Exactly. But for enslavement in Virginia and, and a lot of these other colonies, including Barbados, the, the, the child gained the status of the mother. And this was yeah. purposely done to keep, you know, to keep that enslaved um, status. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, in your article, you mentioned that, you know, there's a connection between sla- of slavery and village. Yes. Would you be able to tell us the two types of village? Um, yes. <laughs> so the two types of uh, villainage. Well, I should say, mm-hmm. first of all, that villainage is another name for serfdom. Mm-hmm. And this is where laborers were tied on tenement, tenements um, to their lord and worked his land. So the two types were villains regardant. And this is where the villain was annexed to the property. So to the, the property of their lord. Yeah. And I believe I argue this in my in my um in my in my book that it's correspondent to the enslaved as real estate. So as we discussed, um real estate when 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 the enslaved were seen as real estate is when they're when they they can be bequeathed, mm-hmm. when they're seen as also something permanent, tied to tied to the land or yeah. you know, a building, a home. 
And so this is similar to Villains Regardant. And then we have Villains in Gross, where the villain was attached to the person of their lord, um, which I believe was similar to the enslaver's chattel. Because as you know, as a chattel, it can be moved. There's something of private property that could be moved and, you know, it could be animate or inanimate. And so that's where I saw some of the similarities starting between that form of labor and enslaved persons. Um, I believe where some of the similarities also dealt is because they were both sellable, they were unaware of their futures, yeah. and they were subjected to beatings and punishments. Um, but where they differed is in terms of English law considered villains or serfs to be subjects of the king, whereas, yeah. you know, enslaved persons were not within the ambit of English law. They were still yeah. considered other. So yeah. I think this is where it, it you know, it, it differentiated, the two types of labor dif differentiated. And also, um, villain, because uh, villains were um, seen as subjects of the king, the king they couldn't be um, maimed mm -hmm. or killed, which was not a, the instance with um, enslaved persons. So ultimately, yep. that's that's a big differentiation. Mm -hmm. Yes, one yes. was one was more valued than the other. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. But you would see lots of instances with cases that came before the English courts in the 1600s, 1700s, where there was a constant arguing of, you know, the British knew how to see property in persons because they did this since, you know, yes. the times of serfdom. And of course the British would argue, no, 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 this was completely different. Mm -hmm. We did not see them as that. And these are the differences. But when you look down to it, it it's still in, in all essence, the, the lords owned yeah. these persons. They had to, like the enslaved, they had to have a license to leave the, the tenements. They couldn't yeah. leave on their own, just as how the enslaved needed tickets. You mm -hmm. know, they had to get permission to marry. The, the the villains also you know yeah. the only difference is they can be killed or maimed that's one of the main differences yeah. yes and then you know lastly for the slave code it was used not only for other templates and other other areas but as well as the template in terms of the policing law because you did mention that earlier in the discussion yeah. and of course with vagrancy and martial law yeah. can you you know just talk to the in terms i guess the legal rights that were impacted to ensure that power was kept to the few yeah, well, you know, as I said, the entire codes, where, where, um, wherever they were used, whether in the Caribbean or in North America, were referred to as the police laws of slavery because they were all manner of control yeah. for, you know, the colonial elite. Um, they controlled their movement. They controlled um any any form of gathering, um, they were to have any form of identity they were to have, um. They, they control their possessions. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, it was, there was nothing they, they did not control. Even when it, it came down to their clothing, they would receive two forms of clothing, two new yeah. items of clothing per year. Per year, yeah. You know, they weren't allowed anything else, you know. Um, so the policing laws of slavery is really, I, I think it was an apt name <laughs> because that's what they did. They, they constantly searched them to see if they had items that were prohibited, to see if they stole, to see whatever it is they had going on undercover, you know. Mm -hmm. And when it came to vagrancy, well, this was borrowed from, there was a 1547 vagrancy law in, in, um, in England, mm -hmm. which was used to uh, curb they claimed <laughs> um, amalgamation of you know homelessness or vagrancy yeah. vagabonds or the sick mm -hmm. from gathering on the streets um, it was really for them to adhere to their masters and to work in these in these um, workhouses yeah. that <laughs> they wanted them to do and where persons like left like after serfdom started to wane where they left these tenements and went into like more urban society seeking jobs you know if they were if they found them on streets or if they did not adhere to you know whatever practice they wanted them to adhere to they would um this this particular law gave them the ability to arrest them and put them in an enslavement for two years you know without question mm -hmm. the law didn't last but the point is that the English were, they were able, they were capable yeah. of devising such 
So they were capable of devising the same for enslaved Africans, you know, because if you even look at some of the provisions they had to control them, they were chaining them, yeah. they were branding them on the face, you know. Um, it was very similar. They also had a ticketing system. Mm -hmm. They also enslaved their children. So again, if they had this ability to do that to those vagabonds, they also had it, they had the ability to do it within the colonies. And this yeah. carried on even, I think, where you saw a lot um, of the pertinence of the vagrancy laws were post um, the post uh, the end of post emancipation, mm -hmm. where a lot like like the the serfs when they left the tenements seeking mm -hmm. jobs in urban societies when the formerly enslaved left the plantation seeking urban work, um, there were laws against vagrancy. And I mean, one of those laws, the Tongan and Country Law, is still in effect in Jamaica. Can you believe it? Oh. I think it's still in effect in a lot of the colonies. Whereas if they found persons outside after a certain hour, they could arrest them and have them jailed um, for drunkenness, for public, you know, disorder yeah. and indecency. And all this was for forced labor. Because if you look at like even the chain gangs, mm, you know, in yes. America, that's where it started because you mm -hmm. had a set of people leaving the plantation system. Yeah. Seeking work and, um, and just, probably enjoying their liberty <laughs> but even then they were not allowed to do that because they wanted to keep them on this level of, of what became sharecropping you yeah. know yeah so it's 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 really interesting how something so far back still had a knock-on effect you know throughout time yeah no no definitely because I mean what you're just describing is very similar to what I guess what happened in the Panama Canal in terms of the building in terms of people leaving from the Caribbean going to that area and of course housing wasn't available for everybody unless you had exactly. a had a job and the, this this is the type of thing that they would use to kind of control and get people off the streets type of thing um exactly. in that area right so exactly. it's it definitely as you said it definitely repeats and if we don't know from where everything origins from it comes from some place as to why it's coming into effect exactly. at a certain time right exactly yes yes yeah, and just, um yeah go ahead <laughs> no no it's just it's just how we all look at things right we want to yes. see things a certain way um and 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 question what they are and where they're coming from then fine yes. but definitely these are you know as you're as you're talking I mean it, it's just definitely going through all the stuff that I've read um, yes. it, it does repeat over and over it does and um lastly lastly about martial law um well martial law they most of the English-speaking colonies um initiated uh some type of militia law for times of unrest because you know martial law comes in in times of emergency and mm -hmm. civil unrest or disturbances and they initiated this when there were like a serious uprising or rebellion yeah. so that they can quell it fast. Um, with the exception of Jamaica, as I mentioned earlier, Jamaica was a martial law society yeah. from its inception of British colonization because they felt it necessary to do so. Martial law was constantly in effect because they had, you know, two threats against them. Yeah. They had the constant threat of the Spanish trying to re- you know, recolonize mm -hmm. Jamaica. And then they had the um the existing um formerly enslaved persons from the Spanish from the Spanish right. colonization who were there and started a marinage movement, then um enticing mm -hmm. <laughs> to enticing is what they would say, enticing their enslaved population to then run away and form the Mar maroon communities. So they had martial law constantly in effect in Jamaica yeah. from then. Um yeah. No, it's no, it's great. Well, not great, but I mean it's great that you've been able to take your time to come and explain all of this and talk about you know the slave codes because some of those pieces of what was defined as a people, unfortunately, yeah. are still existing and we're still, you know, going yes. against and yes. trying to redefine ourselves and as well trying to, you know, gain our culture as to what that is, this has been yes. kind of taken out of us, so to speak, yes. right, yes. Um, yes. in terms of not being uh, defining. And then just the fact that at a point in time, another group of human beings were then used 
and then defined not even as human beings, but as property. Mm -hmm. Right? And that totally yeah. changed the direction yeah. of a group of people outside of um of of uh, outside of Africa, right? Yes. So yes, definitely. It, it definitely um has, you know, makes you think at times, right? In yes, terms of uh, of things and, and even right now where there's supposed to be the the decade of the um African diaspora. But again, we don't hear much about that, right? Yes. And there's not yes. much celebrated other than on the first day, maybe 10 years ago, as to what was announced um, as to what they were Hope doing you enjoyed this individuals episode. that are And if you did, please African make sure to like, follow, subscribe, so, and thank write you a so much. I for really the do episode appreciate that you were able to come on to your Justin podcast. And thank you. Justine, sorry, and to be able to speak to, to all of us. You're welcome. It was great speaking to you all, Thank you. Thank you.